Can everybody hear me? <clears throat> okay, let's, uh, we can get started uh, for tonight's special meeting of the City Council. I will uh, call the meeting to order and uh, I'll start out with uh, talking about some meeting logistics. And I'll just mention to people, we have uh, always have the agenda posted on the city webpage. And if you're uh, subscribing to the city manager's weekly updates, you will also get that. And we also have printed copies on the table by the side of the room. Now, anyone who's appearing remotely, please indicate your, change your name on your display to your first and last name. Uh, anyone who uh, speaks, please indicate by stating your name and where you live. We, uh, pursuant to our rules of uh, conduct, we ask that you keep your comments to two minutes, and Councillor Bate will assist us with the uh, with timekeeping. Um, anyone who speaks must be called on by the chair, and uh, please keep your comments pertinent to the uh, to the matter we're discussing. We'll start by first item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Is Does anyone know of any changes to tonight's agenda? Okay, hearing none, the agenda is approved. Next item on the agenda is general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any matter that is not on tonight's agenda. And I will start with the recognizing people in the room. Uh, Steve Whitaker, you're standing up, so I'm guessing you're seeking to be recognized. Yes, Steve Whitaker. Uh, there are not any agendas over here on the side of the room to correct the chair. Uh, so therefore I couldn't speak up ahead of time to ask anything be removed from the consent agenda because I was not able, and there's not one in the book packet that says it's a packet. So, Precision is important, uh, especially when it affects people's rights to speak to and or remove things from the consent agenda. I want to flag the fact that we've spent probably over $100,000 on Chad Bean not working. And I just made the connection to the fact that the union contracts for our police and fire were swept through on a consent agenda with no opportunity for discussion. So the fact that you're squandering the public's tax dollars, paying somebody to not come to work uh, while, you know, under fear of threat of litigation is really not of service to the community. Um, the trash continues to overflow. Uh, the snow plowing is leaving, like the handicapped spot in front of the Kellogg Hubbard Library is half full of snow. Many of the snow debris from the plow, large chunks, uh, more than a foot of ice that could damage automobiles are left in the road. This is not okay. This is, it's irresponsible. It's not what we're paying for in tax dollars. So I really wonder if we don't need a system of somebody to check and, and report this stuff back because apparently none of y'all notice it and it shouldn't be left to me to come here and run around town and take photos of the, the garbage overflowing and the, you know, the public works failures and have y'all just yawn and you know say that it's it's par for the course i also want to call to the question i understand you may be running for mayor and the fact that when i raise serious issues about the accountability of the money that the city money that goes to good samaritan and the theft and the sexual assaults that were going on there and you just said i find no merit to any of it and swept it under the rug similarly you are on the police review commission and the killing Chad Bean of Mark Johnson, where there was clear records in the dispatch system that this person was suicidal, hallucinating, off his meds, unstable, wanted to jump off the bridge, and he was well beyond the distance of any marksman with a pistol. So Chad Bean was not under threat, and we shot him and killed him, and you swept that under the rug without proper airing. Those are festering issues in this community with trust and leadership. And it's not okay to have people who sweep things under the rug take a leadership. It's time to start putting this city on a healing process. And that means less corruption and cover-ups going on. 
um, I'm a little too angry to proceed with the rest of my two minutes. Thank you. Anybody else inside the room looking to be recognized? I don't see anybody. And <clears throat> anyone joining us online? I do not see any hands raised, but I'll just pause for a moment to see. Okay. Um, unless someone speaks out, I will move to the next item on the agenda, which is the consent agenda, and we have nothing on the consent agenda. Moving to item six, the Country Club Road presentation, and that's where we are. Uh, great, thank you, um, Mr. Council President. Uh, I'm gonna quickly turn this over to our, our project team, which is uh, planning our community development specialist, Josh Jerome, our community, our communications, Specialist uh, Coordinator Evelyn Prim, Recreation Director Arnie McMullen, and from White and Burke, Stephanie Clark. So I don't know what, uh, and I would just, well, and I think tonight's uh, presentation is basically to outline the findings on the site and uh, then lay out the next future steps. So it's not really, um, it's meant to be more of a site specific uh, update uh, you, than it is to be full discussion on the, the future uses that we've got sessions coming. So with that, I'll turn it over to Josh. You probably need to be on top of the mic more. Uh, Stephanie is going to handle the, the beginning of the presentation here, and she is online. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay in the room? I can, yes. Great. And on um, hopefully everyone remotely can too. Callie might be the only one I can see. So hi, Callie. <laughs> Thanks for nodding. Okay, great. Um, with me tonight, I also have Brad Ketterling from VHB, if you want to wave, Brad. Um, and from Black Rivers Design, we have Mike Vitti and Jim Drummond, both available to answer questions once we get into things a little bit more, um, questions on the site findings. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, and have some slides to go through so we can kind of all be on the same page. Very excited to be here tonight. It is the culmination of a lot of work and the, as you know, a lot of history over the last several months where we've been deep in the weeds on the uh, site planning and due diligence. <clears throat> tonight, we're going to go through an update on the process. I want to tell you where we've been and where we are and where we're going, just a reminder to some, but uh, education to others. Uh, recap the fall community conversations we had. Josh is going to give you some data on housing, and we'll explain that a little more, and um, recap the, the site due diligence findings, which I know everyone's anxious to hear more about all the due diligence we, we've done. And then lastly, we're going to preview this, the tight site test sketches, the opportunities and constraints plans, which, as Bill had mentioned, um, this is a preview leading into what's come forthcoming, as you saw in your packet. We're having a series of public meetings and creating a full court press of uh, education, community education around these sketches to encourage the conversation and gather input. And so tonight is not the night for deep diving into the actual sketches, but more of a process update and a site update, and then kind of letting you know about these next steps. And we hope that uh, we're happy to answer questions about all of those. And we hope that everyone who's at this meeting can join us for some of the community meetings. So just to review the process where we've been, the community, the city acquired the property in the spring and there were community conversations begun back then. We picked up the consulting team was hired in September and we continued those community conversations through the fall. Concurrently, we worked on the due diligence studies and the analyses and that concluded in about December. We're now in the winter fit stage, evaluating the opportunities and constraints with a series of public meetings and opportun different opportunities for input. Then this work is going to continue into the spring with concept planning and more public meetings. This is going to be a new set of plans for the community to respond to. And following that, we're going. that's when the council is going to need to make a decision to put forward the the, the chosen plan so that the team can put together what's called an actionable master plan. 
And that will have a set of recommendations for more due diligence, more opportunities for input. And please note, this is not a final land plan as many factors are subject to change based on the due diligence that is found in those future phases. What I wanna note about process here, because process is important, is that we know time is of the essence. Uh, funding is available now that may not be available forever. We know that there are needs right now, very significant needs right now. However, we are also following a process to maintain transparency, to be inclusive of as many per, uh, perspectives as possible, and to ensure the best practices of following due diligence. So that means that development is still a few years away. And I just say that so that it sets the understanding for the community that this isn't happening tomorrow. So in, this win in the fall process, what we heard was that an inclusive and transparent process is paramount. So to meet people where they are, I just wanted to give you a quick summary of all the different ways that during this phase, stage where we're getting into some of the testing and opportunities and constraints and the use of the site itself, we are trying to find as many stakeholders as possible. Um, the, as I said, there are meetings coming up. Those meetings are on the 28th, the 2nd of, of February and the 9th of February. There is a Polco link on the website that people can go to to register or to, to state their interest in attending. It is not required to register, but we are encouraging the community to do that so we can gauge attendance, make sure we have enough space for everybody. We've, we've uh, created an educational poster that's gonna be posted around town in civic and public places. There's a handout being distributed at, uh, there was one handout distributed at the first farmer's market, notifying people of the opportunities for input and also another going to be distributed, distributed at this weekend's farmer's market. The educational poster and paper copy of the survey will be distributed with Meals on Wheels deliveries. We've also created a video. <laughs> It's a five minute video, very sh as short as could possibly be, um, to be available on the website on the YouTube city's YouTube channel. By the end of the week, this will be posted, describing the property and the opportunities and the questions to the public, sending the public to the survey in particular, um, because we understand that this meetings are not for everyone. <laughs> that is some of the feedback we heard. Um, the, poll, the survey is going to be using Polco, which the city has used before. There's a link on the website. There will be a QR code on the print materials. That will be open through um, the 17th of February and is intended to gather input from all, a range of people. Josh will be featured on Vermont Viewpoint on WDEV with Pat McDonald on January 24th at 9 a.m. We are gonna have plans physically located up at City Hall, the library and the rec center. And then updates will regularly go out via the recreation and Montpelier live newsletters, as well as the site specific, this project specific newsletter, which people can sign up for if they haven't already on the Facebook page, on the Montpelier website, they can sign up for the newsletter. We will continue to post on Facebook, Front Porch Forum and the bridge. There's a January bridge article coming out by um, Bill focusing on this project and leading into the public engagement meetings. I'm gonna take a quick breath here. <laughs> so it's a lot of ways to get involved. We encourage everybody to spread the word as much as possible. Please share the video on social media. Please get others to take the survey or to attend a meeting or watch, um, or watch the video. With that said, I'd like to talk a little bit about the fall process and explain some of what we found. There were several meetings conducted, uh, public meetings, stakeholder meetings, butter meetings. We received many emails, had many conversations, and we also surveyed the Montpelier business community as well as the Montpelier high school students. 83 high school students responded to a survey giving their opinion about this as well. And these were some of the findings, but not surprisingly, the top three priorities identified were housing, recreation, and environmental sensitivity. The top planning concerns among most stakeholders were transportation and site access. And the top procedural concern was ensuring an inclusive and transparent process. So because housing is such a top priority, we wanted to give a little more data for the council to consider. Um, ultimately, you will be the ones making the decision to direct the land plan, the actual master plan um, that will indicate housing types. 
So we wanted to make sure council had what it needed in order to make the kind of decision that needs to be made about housing product. So Josh can speak to this more and I will handle the slides. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, I think it's no surprise to anybody who's paying attention that Montpelier is an aging community, just like a lot of communities around the state. Um, you can see the fastest growing age cohort is 65 to 74 years old, um, according to ACS estimates. Um, all of this data is ACS. It's not the decennial 2020 data, which will be uh, a little more accurate um, in the next data tranche to be released will be this coming May. Uh, so we'll have some better some better data to go off from this spring. Um, but we are an aging community. Um, next slide. Um, and so what's important to also recognize is we're an aging community and the average household size continues to decrease over the last few decades. Um, 1974, the average size was almost four. Um, now, Montpelier's average size is 1.9. Um, so you have an aging population, not as many people living um, in the housing stock that's available. Next slide. Um, and so this shows um, the mismatch of housing stock that we have, studios, one bedrooms, two, three, four, five, and more, compared to the household size of our community, um, where 45% of our household size um, is actually one person households, although less than 10% of our housing stock um, is studio, um, less, I think it's 21% is studio and one bedroom. So there's a real mismatch um, on that, the younger professional end who's a single person needing a space, there's not a lot of options out there for them. And on the opposite end, where you have uh, the elders of our community, um, you might have one or two people in a house with four or five bedrooms. Um, so there's a mismatch. Um, and again, this is very common uh, in communities throughout you know, the Northeast, Vermont. Um, we're an overbuilt um, community because we're not having the large families that we once were. Next slide. Um, and we're not keeping up um, with producing enough housing stock in Montpelier. Um, this, this next slide slows, uh, shows the rate uh, of change in the housing supply, um, which has diminished greatly since, 19, since the 1980s. Um, according to ACS estimates, it has picked up a little bit um, since 2010. But again, we'll have some better numbers come this, uh, this spring from the census. Um, but still, it's not enough. It's not enough of new units being created. Next slide. Um, and real estate um, transactions in our community continue to, to rise. Um, the average single family residence um, sold in 2022 was almost $400,000, as opposed to in 2018, um, it was about 277,000. So we've seen a dramatic increase in, in um, single family residence um, cost, as well as multifamily residences. Um, two, in, two unit multifamily residences average about 426,000. Um, but once you get beyond um, four, five, six, seven units, those, those costs escalate up to over a million dollars. Next class. And this, this slide's really important because um, this shows what affordability is in this community um, for renters and for homeowners. Um, so, you know, anybody paying more than 30% uh, of their gross income on their household expenses um, is not considered to be affordable. And based on um, census data, um, it shows that over 35% of Montpelier's renters are in unaffordable renting situations. Um, and likewise, homeowners also, uh, about 16% are in unaffordable situations. This data is, um, is, is old. It's still only 2016 to 2020 ACS estimates. Um, 
I, no doubt that these numbers are probably higher uh, in, in right now in 2023. Um, so something to really focus on is how do we become a more affordable community uh, for renters and for homeowners? Um, and th these are these. This is all the housing slides um, and points that we wanted to make right now. Um, thank you. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. So, um, moving from the housing data, um, the following slides before I I get to them um, are all on the website um, and. I understand that these might be small images, especially for people in the room. So these are all on the website for further review when um, this meeting concludes. Um, Stephanie, can you tell that you're frozen? Okay, uh, I'm back. So everyone can hear me okay? All right. Um, 16 years in this business, that has never happened. I am so sorry. I appreciate everyone's patience and understanding that I am human and in Burlington. And I was just telling Josh before this that I was hoping that 35s weren't going to cause interference. And here we are. So. Thank you so much for your patience. I'm going to load up my screen here and we'll pick up where we left off. Um, so, as I was saying, the due diligence phase, we were in the process of um, talking about the findings. So, these, these plans, again, these plans will be on the website um, tomorrow that you can see in bigger detail, but VHB environmental scientists performed both an evaluation of existing online mapping maintained by ANR as well as field inventories in September and October of 2022 for various natural resources, including wetlands, streams, rare plant species, and natural communities. These studies determined that a variety of natural resources are present within the project parcel, including wetlands and intermittent per and perennial streams, and are subject that are subject to state and federal jurisdiction. Streams generally flow from north to south, draining to the Winooski River. And the largest wetland features are located in the steep and forested um, southern portion of the parcel, some distance from the areas being evaluated for potential development that we'll get into next. No rare, threatened, and endangered plant species were observed with only one uncommon plant species mapped in one of the forested, the forested wetland features. Streams and wetlands and their respective state regulated buffers are shown on the natural resources map, which is in front of you now called existing conditions, and are included as the underlays on the sketches we're, we're going to see. Additionally, soil mapping indicates there are primary agricultural soils here. They underlie much of the project area, including most of the former golf course area there in the yellow. The traffic assessment also conducted by VHB evaluated access, traffic volumes, and, the, and transit determined that there is adequate capacity at the US to intersection with Country Club Road, but that with any significant development, a signal will be warranted. This study also identified the well-known issue of limited access and poor accessibility. And the traffic and access we identify as something we'll need to put forward in the recommendation for phase two to be studied more carefully once there's a desired development plan in place. The archaeological assessment was conducted by Crown Consulting. Six sites were identified within under, the undisturbed wooded sections and along the southern margins of the golf course. And then it, the existing building itself, the clubhouse that's shown here on the plan, was assessed by Black River Design, and they found that it was in good shape and could be reused with some limitations. For example, low ratio of exterior wall surface to floor area and some limited headroom. 
That's as much as I'm going to go into tonight, but all of those studies can be found in the city council packet on the website that will also be within the on this, the Country Club Road page um, for anyone to review. And a summary of that has been in the memo that we provided to council. The buildable areas map that's also within the packet and on the website highlights the notable opportunities and constraints for development of any kind. This is overlaid on top of the natural resources, but it really highlights where there can be development, where there can't be development, and what kind of limitations there are in each of these nodes. So that brings us to the question for winter 2023. This is the question for the public. Knowing the site feature limitations now and the community's identified needs, how would you lay out the site? So we, we have prepared some test sketches is what they're called. This is, at this stage of the process, we're starting with looking at housing and recreation. Those are the most land intensive uses. There, the feedback that we got in the fall was that varying types of housing was desired, varying types of recreation was desired. We are showing in these sketches two kind of extremes, one being maximum housing, one being maximum recreation, and showing something on the spectrum in between. And we're starting here because we wanna gather feedback and direction about the scale, what to include and what to accommodate and start envisioning the massing on the site. We because of the way we're doing this process, we can't presume to know what the desire of the community would be. So we know that this is these, these sketches are not exhaustive. They do not address all of the features that are gonna be needed to be included on the actual master plan. They don't address wildlife corridors or full connection to abutting properties or solve the transportation issues. But because this is an iterative process, those will depend on the direction from this particular stage. So test A is maximum housing. This shows a mix of a lot of different types of housing product, three and five story multifamily, triplexes, single family, some on smaller lots, some on larger lots. This limits the recreation to really the two wooded Eastern and Western areas. And some light recreation can occur in the stream and wetland buffers. Um, but maximum housing is going to produce approximately 513 units. The ne next test shows the other end of the spectrum. What if it was entirely recreation? Absolutely no new housing, approximately 300,000 square feet of fields, a cluster of recreation buildings, new and the conversion of the existing, totaling around 66,000 square feet some hillside recreation and the pres preservation and use of those natural areas to the east and west. And then somewhere kind of on that spectrum is what we're calling the balanced housing and recreation plan, test C, which shows that it could possibly accommodate between 170 to 230 units, um, depending on if you went up three stories or five stories, shows a mix of multifamily, triplexes, single family, approximately 120 square feet of fields, a cluster of recreation buildings, new and conversion of existing, again, totaling about 66,000 square feet, some smaller hillside recreation, and the preservation of those two Eastern and Western nodes. So again, these are not final concepts. This is an order of magnitude exercise to gain an understanding of the community's desired direction, not a decision for these particular land uses. While these address some of the community's concerns, such as the existing, many people said they wanted to see the existing developed areas um, be used for future development. And we show some areas where you could connect to abutting properties. The future concepts will need to take into account more design considerations like view sheds, wildlife corridors, reuse of those walking paths, the more um, granular. And it's not known if we can meet all of these desires, um, but the design team will attempt to show the various impacts and accommodations required to get to those desired outcomes. So we have a variety of questions for the public that we're gonna be putting out there in the video, as well as capturing some of these in the survey. Um, we hope that folks will participate and get us their opinions um, and get us their feedback on these plans through all the various channels we previously discussed. So please, my ask is that 
you encourage others to visit the website, to look at the materials, to take the survey, come to one of our meetings. And with that, I'll stop so we can get to questions. I can leave my screen up um, or I can take it down so that we can see each other. It's up to the will of the council. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, we can start with members of the council. Do we have uh, questions? I don't think we need that. You, you want it up or down? There we go. Okay. Donna, were you raising your hand to go first? Oh, okay. Anybody? I, um, oh. oh, sorry. First, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Um, so um, thank you. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> thank you for all this. Um, it's very comprehensive. And so I'm looking at the different test plans, and you've got the one that's maximizing housing, the one that's all all recreation, the one that's a balance. Um, I'm wondering just in general, how the public input that you've received so far informs the development of these test plans. So um, for instance, the, you, we've got one here that's all recreation. Were there folks who were advocating for that? Was that a strong message that you got from the public that maybe it should be all recreation or all housing or vice versa? And so just, I, I wanted to know how what you heard from the public that made yeah. it into these test plans. Gotcha, yeah, great question. Um, no, there were a few people that said no development whatsoever, no um, housing development or, you know, any kind of big physical footprint. Um, and there were people who said they really wanted as much housing as possible. So there were a few opinions. I would not say that those represented the, the majority of opinions by any means. But the purpose of showing kind of when people, when there's people that have said, we really want housing and we really want recreation, some have been stronger on one, stronger on another. We wanted to show what those compromises will be. If you really want more housing, this is what you might be giving up in terms of recreation. And if this is what you want for recreation, this is how much housing you might be giving up. So it was a way to kind of put um, a, a, a contrast in front of people for them to understand kind of the different trade-offs because it's not an infinite site. So I, I would say to answer your question more directly, we got opinions on the entire spectrum. Most people I would say were more centered in the center, a little bit of both or more housing than rec or more rec than housing, but only a few on those, on those end of the spectrum. I know uh, Councillor Cohn, uh, has joined us uh, remotely, so why don't you announce yourself and then uh, go ahead with your questions? Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Paige. Oh, frozen. Thank you for the uh, presentation. I just want to ask uh, there are three different tests you called, right? A, B, C, E. And then uh, you show um, in your presentation there are some issues with um, affordable housing. So which one, uh, which test is the best uh, solution for that uh, problem? Have you done anything um, to understand that or they are two different things? I think the question, just to make sure I'm clear, was um, do any of these represent something that's more affordable or less affordable in terms of the housing? Yeah, because we have, yeah, right, we have um, affordable housing issue in our town. So do you think test A or test C will be the, maybe a solution for that? It, 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 have you done anything about it? If you haven't done, it's well, okay. I was just yeah, no, I appreciate yeah. the question. I think it's a great question. Um, and we're writing these down because if you're asking it, someone else might be asking it too. So we want to have, we want to be prepared. So that's really helpful. Um, I wouldn't say we've looked at that question specifically, and these don't get at the affordability question per se, like you kind of said at the end, is it not really comparing apples to apples with that? And that's true. That being said, um, what we know about the housing crisis is that we have a um, housing shortage at all price points. And what's happening is that there's a crunch on a lot of housing product because even if 
you're building a multi-million dollar house, which we're not proposing here, but you had something like that, someone's going to buy that instead of buying up the four bedroom, three bedroom, middle income house that more people need. So you create supply, the supply is going to help your affordability problem. So on that general principle, max housing might be your best solution. That being said, it's very much going to depend on the developer because again, this is not there's a, there's not a scenario in my mind at this stage in winter that I would say the city should be the developer of the housing. More than likely, you're going to subdivide and a piece of this is going to go to a developer, put it out for an RFP with specifications of what the city's looking for, and that developer is going to build the product that you're looking for or or may propose something within a range. And so it could be the test C is just as affordable in terms of producing affordable housing stock because the developer might come forward with a plan that shows the majority of all of that housing to be affordable housing stock. So a little bit will be to be determined. But it's a really good question. We've jotted that down. So thank you. Uh, thanks, Stephanie. I had a couple of thoughts. One had to do with the, <clears throat> the method of uh, getting word out to people and uh, I, I know that the city and the school district are two different entities, but if you could get the, all the teachers to send things home with the kids from the school, that would not only expand the reach, but also get the, hopefully get younger people uh, out since uh, people my age aren't, don't have kids in the schools, but younger yeah. people certainly do. Um, okay, perfect. Yeah. With with regard to I I noticed uh, in in reading through the comments that people made at the meetings or sub, or submitted later, there were um, a number of comments relating to where the uh, recreation center should go and whether it whether we should be putting it on this property at all or whether we should be uh, doing some kind of adaptation of the uh, of the gym up at uh, Vermont uh, College of Fine Arts, and I understand that your mandate has sort of been expanded to also look at the BCFA property, and so uh, may, maybe not. Uh, that's not, not exactly. Um, okay, but continue, and I'll, I'll circle back to that. But, but so, so the question. Uh, is one of the questions about recreation is have you, have you looked at whether uh, the uh, gymnasium building or fitness building at the uh, BCFA is a reasonable uh, prospect for a new recreation center for the city? Yes, oh, okay, that's your question, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, um, yeah, we haven't been necessarily brought in to look at that per se. Um, but we have had some preliminary conversations to see what what might be possible there in terms of if they if it's still available if it's you know if it's available on the market um, those conversations are ongoing I don't have any I don't have any conclusions on that right now but I would say that one of the questions we have you know about that property is would it be suitable for what's needed is it possible to convert is there this you know is the infrastructure of the building such that it would support what's needed. Um, and I don't have an answer to that either, even if it was available. And the question is, you know, is it available for um, purchase or have those conversations proceeded? So I don't, I don't have an answer for that, but it's a concurrent conversation the city is having, I would say. Thanks. And with regard to the, uh, to uh, another, another recreation related question, in the in the hybrid model, which I think was uh, model C, um, does that uh, provide enough room for the kind the kind of modernized uh, recreation facility that we're uh, we're looking for? So that that's a great question. the The footprint and the kind of I wouldn't go so far as even calling it a blueprint. The kind of overall concept that was used for the test C and, and for test B um, building wise came from the recreation center. 
and the recreation center or the uh, rec department, I mean, came um, up with kind of a, this would be what's ideal um, from, from that, from their perspective. And so Max Recreation in particular has all the elements. Um, test C, the balance does not. It has, um, you know, less rec fields, for example, than would be ideal. But that was kind of our, our, our starting point. But more research is needed too about what exactly is needed for recreation um, for the community. And so this was really a starting point for the community to respond to. Okay. Thanks. And Carrie? Um, yeah, I guess I kind of have a follow up on that about the, um, you said that the, the recreation department gave you information that you used to, for the test plan that had recreation in it. And I'm wondering if, if that's in this 109 page document that we got somewhere. Um, I didn't see it. You didn't read every word of every I page. Not. Carrie. Um, <laughs> no, it's not. No, you you're you're okay. You're astute to point out it's not in there. This was a this came out of conversation. We had several conversations with the rec department. And, um, and some, was some of the did the public input inform any of that at all as well, or or was not it specifically it? what's on the plans shown yet? Again, we're starting kind of with the with the highest and and factoring in some of the elements that a lot of the elements that were in that uh, recommendation from the rec department do capture what was mentioned in the community because it included everything. <laughs> um, yeah, it included almost everything that, that folks have been saying. Okay, Donna. Uh, Stephanie, I'm a visual person and the three uh, scenarios of your test sketches went by too, too fast because they weren't in the attachment. So I will have a lot more once I see that, but it comes back to the questions of you're gathering information and you said you use the Montpelier Rec Department and they gave us some scenarios before we obtained the purchase of the country club. And we did a lot of surveying of what was needed when we looked at the Berry Street Rec renovations. So I'm assuming you have all of that. I don't think I do. I think what we have, what was given to me was from the rec department of the most recent, I would say, um, culmination of that. And maybe is, I don't know, Bill, if Arnie is there um, in the room. He is, so he may have some information. Yeah. I mean, it'd be nice if, if we had names for all the sketches they provided us before we got in, into And the were list. those not in the packet? I thought we provided yeah, those sketch points. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Online version. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't have the online version. Yeah. Okay, I have to reopen. Thank you. Because I'm a visual person too, well, Donna. <laughs> and, and, and before you get into that, my other question, which you can think about why uh, Arnie's talking, is I was curious as to who you've been talking to outside of um, the city, like are there land developers or housing developers that you just had in casual conversations of what they felt as far as a balance of trying to mix dense housing with single housing um, and, you know, and any other groups that were interested in the uses of the property. Is that happening now or is that going to be at one of the other stages? Okay, I'll think about that and Arnie can and speak to the rec. Yeah. Hi, Arnie McMullen from the Recreation Department. Testing? Okay. <laughs> um, speak right into them. Arnie from the Recreation Department. Yeah, they asked me for an idea of what we were looking at for a footprint for a, com and let's, let's change the name from Recreation Center to Community Center, because one of the things we don't want to do is outgrow um, a possible facility um, before we even get started. I mean, when you look at community type buildings, you want to look 50 to 100 years into the future, because this is stuff that's going to be used far beyond my time here. Um, but one of the things we wanted to make sure we included was an indoor walking track, because as people spoke, we have an aging community. A lot of seniors can't walk outside in the winter time, and people with access issues can't either. Um, so this would provide that, but we're trying to look for multiple space use gyms, you know, having, um, 
you know, two or three basketball courts. So we could think about in the future AAU tournaments, which mm-hmm. bring a lot of people to community, um, talk about economic opportunities for businesses, um, you know, and different things like that. And many other core functions that we do, like our youth basketball program. Um, we're struggling right now just to have space for our youth basketball program because it is more challenging to use some of the other facilities in the city. So, you know, part of what we want to make sure we do is we don't outgrow it in the first year. Um, I did give them a a ballpark square footage, but you know, it depends how big you want to make the footprint, whether you go out or up. Um, but it does include community rooms, um, and other types of things that you would use in a community center for possibly even having, uh, community dinners if you wanted to do something like that and we also talked about that this could also be a um an emergency space so if you know there was an issue you have an emergency shelter that's certainly out of the floodplain which not a lot all of our facilities are (laughs) so um you know so those are some things we're trying to think about of all the possible uses um that a community center could use and also for senior programming you know, so they they have a very tight space where they are right now. Um, so. so I think part of the question from Council Member Bate was when we were looking at this two or three years ago, and it, we ultimately at that point were going to renovate the rec center. Mm-hmm. We did a community survey of what people wanted to see in a rec center. You remember that? We, yep. And so the question is, is that feedback include was that provided that's correct yeah we included what was part of that we just so that was all given to that was provided to the consultant yeah well and likewise in that discussion we talked about not only exercise rooms but chair space for child care Mm -hmm. and and so i don't you know i don't i I don't know if that's going to be a link behind her drawing so we know where your mindset is now with the bigger picture but i'd love to have a comprehensive not, not to interrupt, but I think the 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 specific uses of the space is something that's you know we're we're Further a little behind that right now. It's sort of the massing. You just if we'd have this much area for rec, and then what went in it, and who ran it, and how that all worked would be something we'd we'd move toward. So I, I child care I know has been a huge need identified. Yeah, I'm only concerned in thinking of those in as much as they're included in the footprint. That's all. That's all. Thank you. And they did also mention the existing building, which has child care in it now, would be a potential. Not big enough. Not big enough. Not big enough. You could be right. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Arnie, I'll ask you the same question that I asked Stephanie about the uh, Vermont College gym and whether you have looked at that and have any thoughts. Well, honestly, I spent uh, about three years on that campus. Um, I, I, uh, did my, uh, did my time at Norwich. Uh-huh. <laughs> I graduated from there and, uh, I was a gym supervisor at Vermont college at the time when they had that. And that really, you're not trading much. You're actually going a lateral move. So if you want to see, in my opinion, if you want to see recreation grow and create a real community center, I don't think that's the space that's going to do it for you. So Great. Thanks. It's, it's about the same size as the current gym right now. I think that's what I'd heard that from someone. Carrie? Yeah, I have a question about the scope of this this work that the consultants are doing, because um, you had mentioned that there, you, you were under the impression that their scope had expanded to include looking at the, no, is that correct? Is that no, correct? no. Okay. The, the, we hired them to do this project. I don't uh, Is part of the feedback with VCFA was, uh, excuse me, this site, they were people in the community that said, should we look at VCFA? And we convened a conversation. Their firm is also doing VCFA. So that may be where the confusion is that, so they- Right, okay. So, um, and so they've kind of done the Chinese, you know, the firewall between um, between that. So we convened a conversation just to see what was available, but I know Stephanie's not working on that project at all. Yeah, not it, not me. <laughs> and David's not working on our project. So they're okay. split up. So I think that might be where the confusion is. We did have a conversation about where it was at. Um, and at that point, 
that our thinking about what was needed wasn't far enough along to really make it you know so i think to the stephanie's statement that um there were that there are ongoing conversations we're open to it but we're not really that's not what we're focusing so I wanted to get back to Councillor Bates' um, question. Uh, you asked about other land developers, if other um, housing developers have opined or anything. We have not gone that far yet. That feels a little premature at this stage, again, because if the um, community comes back saying, we really want like more rec and really keep that housing super confined to just the very um, entrance to the site, for example, that will very much dictate what can be done and a lot of what a developer is going to look at is available acreage and what is available, you know, and where is that going to be located. And I think your point is that they could provide a perspective about how the uses um, kind of interface. And, you know, how do you how do you bring the two together? And that's why we have VHB on because VHB does the land planning for developers. I mean, they, that's what they do. Um, and so a developer would actually use VHB to do the land planning. And so we're using them to help us envision what that would look like. So these are three scenarios, obviously two extremes and one in the middle that show how those things could interface. And then we'll kind of, where I think we're probably gonna end up is somewhere on that spectrum. And it's gonna be about the dial and how do you bring those things together? And then this next phase is really, stage is really gonna be pulling in well, there's all these elements we also want, solar array or, um, you know, skate park or dog park. You know, how do we incorporate all of that and, and accommodate it within this space? Well, yes, and I, I understand the timing, but I do think there's an advantage for you, you having in your repertoire the information that a realtor like has, as well as land developers, on what people look for and what, what happens when you start mixing dense housing, whether it's condos or duplexes with singles housing, that's all. I was just thinking yep. so that when we then reach for the stars, we have somebody standing there saying, well, there is this market yeah. pattern for people. Yes. This is what we found. Because luckily yes. we've had a lot of local developers develop in housing recently. And mm -hmm. so I would think they would have a lot of experience we could gain from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Donna? I'm sorry, Lauren. I'm sorry. Um, Looking right at you. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of the questions I had um, have been asked. I mean, I think it's notable that it looks like it really simplifies things, that you're really centering the rack at the existing building, that that looks like a usable building. Like there's not multiple places where maybe putting a rec center would be appropriate. So like in a lot of ways, the designs look very scalable and like you could do like a little more housing and it looks like there's a lot of sites that are appropriate for housing, which is really exciting um, that there's a number of configurations. So, I mean, I think in a lot of ways, this really narrows the questions for the community in a really nice way. So I'm excited <laughs> to see that, that like we yeah. can really get to the crux of like, what's that balance um, between housing and rec and, um, you know, making this just a great site that's meeting a lot of community needs, ideally. So, I mean, overall, I'm just kind of eager to get the community feedback. Um, I know we've talked about it before, but um, the Social and Economic Justice Committee, I know that there were some, um, you know, questions raised about how to make sure we're like mm -hmm. reaching as many people as possible. I think that group would continue to be um, interested and in, you know, if you want to join one of our meetings, um, meet at 8 a.m. <laughs> um, and happy to invite you and do some brainstorming of reaching some of those harder to reach communities um, to get some of that feedback and really um, put that into this process. But really, really great to see all this and appreciative of all the work that's clearly. Thank yeah, thank you. you. And you you highlighted a point I didn't get a chance to say, which is um, you're right, that the, that the natural resources themselves and the opportunities and constraints of the site itself does dial in um, where development can happen. And it was the recommendation of the land planners that you do put your recreation down centered where kind of the existing infrastructure is. Because again, if you're having, you know, more people visit the site than live there because they're visiting the recreation, you don't want them driving through your neighborhoods and your, your small streets to get to the rec center. 
Um, so that made a lot of sense. And I think uh, to answer your other point, we did, yeah, we were consulting, as you know, with CJAC in the fall, and that was very informative to um, some of their recommendations for just city procedure in general, informed some of that list, very long list of the different ways we're trying to do outreach, but we're still open to other suggestions. This is, um, you know, a multiple week, month long stage, and there's an opportunity in the spring to do this again. So it's always process improvement. Uh, thanks, Palin. Yeah, thank you. I was uh, wondering what will happen uh, old recreation center buildings if they decided to move this new uh, place. Is there any plan about it? We will keep it like, again, recreation buildings or there will be a plan to turn them into a housing. So I, I would say that is an open question. There's no, you know, we have had a lot of discussion about possible uses for that building, uh, including keeping it as recreation, including using it for uh, some facility for the homeless community to, you know, housing. Uh, and I think we would probably undergo a similar, perhaps not, it wouldn't have to be as long because we wouldn't have all the natural resources inventory, I think, but I think we would probably do another community process, um, but certainly there's some urgent needs. Uh, so my thought would be, as soon as we make a decision about what we're going to do and you know, say the say for the sake of discussion that that decision in, involved proposing and building a rec center at country club road you know that process in itself you know then designing building getting funding is going to take a year or two constructing it so while while we're preparing for that move we would then be preparing uh so we would be we wouldn't be wasting time so we could know immediately what was going to happen to that building you know that building has a huge amount of challenges it has asbestos it's not accessible uh it's 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 a funky old building so we, you know there i think there would be a serious question it should be evaluated whether reuse attempted to readaptive reuse of that building makes sense or you know whether it be taken down or just rebuilt uh, into something new and <clears throat> you know, more suitable to what the future needs would be. Thank you. Donna. Uh, now, in the packet that I did find was the uh, discussion about the existing building, the old Elks Club building. Are we discussing that tonight? Um, we can, I mean, clarifying questions about that assessment. I think, I, I think we totally can, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, sure, you, you have quest so questions or I, observations. Well, I there. I, mean, I guess I was looking for observations from Stephanie's group and from Black River as to you know just sort of going over this so that the council and the public both have it in their mind. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean Jim or Mike um, could probably give you the the two minute spiel of of overview so that you have the the context and then you could bore into some specific questions if that's helpful. I, I would prefer that. That'd be great. Yes. Um, Jim or Mike? Uh, I, don't know I don't know really where to start, except that our general conclusion is that the building that's there is in actually quite good shape. Um, it lends its, I mean, as we wrote in our existing conditions report, there are some uses it doesn't lend itself to so well. Um, for example, housing, because the amount of interior volume to the amount of exterior wall where you could have windows is not a very good ratio. Um, and it wouldn't be very good for you couldn't do like a like a gym where there's ball games or something like that because there's not any spaces with enough ceiling height but that said there's a lot of other things you could do that could be potential uses in a community center including sort of um, health workout type spaces or community meeting rooms or catering facilities or commercial office space um, daycare there, there's any number of things that could go in there and it's as they say, there's there's a quite a lot of retained value in the building from from what we've observed. So, and we could know. do we could do a lot of that with <clears throat> well, essentially re retaining the shell and just configuring what the inside of the building uh, looks like. It's pretty flexible that way because it is actually a steel frame um, with you know sort of non-bearing partitions in it, so it's. It's not like an old wood house or something where, you know, all the walls are holding up the floors above 
10. So th there's a fair amount of flexibility with, you know, not unlimited, but, but quite, quite, quite good. I don't know, Mike, did, did I miss anything or? No, well, not for me, you didn't, but okay. anyway, thank you. Uh, but my other, my other question then, again, it's part of the process. When the hub expressed interest in perhaps creating a public-private partnership, we talked about that we might need to reach out in the community to see if other groups are interested. Do, do you foresee something in the future that we would be doing that as part of this act of looking at not only this building, but seeing if indeed there were other organizations in the community that wanted to join us? Right. Yes. Yes. It's it's really for, for their aspects. My, my yeah. other comment would be as if it helps maybe raise money or, or get some, some funding, it might be an avenue to look at. I don't know how you would go about it exactly, but sorry, Stephanie, I don't know if I cut that off. That's okay. Yeah, okay. No, we, yeah we, where that falls in the process, Donna, I'm not 100% right now, um, because again, it's so hard to predict the process when the pub, we want the public to guide the process, so we can't predict what the public will say. Um, again, what if, what if the response was, yeah, we, we need 500 units. Like, I don't care about, you know, this, let's put recreation elsewhere. That little existing building can be converted into something. But otherwise, you know, I don't think, I don't know that that's out of the realm of possibility. I really just don't. Um, and so that would then dictate those kinds of conversations. So I would say it's in the process though, and it could even be a, a phase two recommendation. Again, if you've got this area designated for rec, how is that going to be programmed? is going to be a pretty detailed analysis that's outside of the scope of this phase because it's also incorporating revenue streams and looking at um, programming and different kinds of cross-pollination that's going to be really important. You mentioned daycare, for example. Now you've got a, you know, another private user, but is it also somehow related to a co-housing use of some sort if you had a developer come forward with from the RFP process you know, that wanted to make use of that? You know, so there's a lot of different iterations. We want to be open to you. And, and it's your own fault, you know, all of you. I mean, you've done such a great job of presenting so many ideas. We want to think the next step and the next step. So you have to contain us, but we don't want to lose these ideas either. So thank you. That's been my life for the last four months. Absolutely. I hear you. I have to say that one of the, I was very encouraged at seeing the, uh, the analysis of the, of the real estate and seeing that there's not major impediments to do a significant amount of housing and other development that we want to see while still retaining a good amount of open space and uh, environmental protection. And so I think that that, given, th given that we got into the uh, purchase uh, fairly quickly, to have it be have have you come back and say, well, this looks like a space that really can be put to use for the the range of possibilities that the people of Montpelier want is very encouraging to me. I think you bring up a, a great point. Um, and I wanted to highlight that, you know, in the natural resources assessment, what we've done is inventory what's there. And um, while what we've highlighted as buildable areas are based on a lot of um, you know, topography and staying out of buffers, there are still some elements we should you know, make sure we're um, flagging for the next phase, which is basically when we get a land idea in mind, then we have to look further, deeper at the impacts. And so, um, for example, primary ag soils is gonna be one of the things that gets impacted if you know, for doing building on, on primary ag soils. Um, one of the complications of a project like this is it's not a straightforward where a lot of times you have a parcel of land and there's a desired use. Um, of the hospital comes in and says, we need a medical clinic here. It needs to be this many square, foot, square feet. Tell us what the impacts are and we'll mitigate them or look through the permit implications. In this case, um, we're doing it a bit iteratively here and almost in reverse. So it's telling us, okay, we think we can do this. Let's see what we want to build. And then we have to go back though and test it against permit regulations. We have to get approvals for that. Um, so when I said like the actionable master plan is not 
necessarily the final land plan. That's because there's additional steps that will need to be taken to make sure that these things are doable and completely feasible. But you can't go all the way down that path until you know what you want to build. <laughs> so we're running into a bit of chicken and egg um, as it goes with master planning. Okay, thanks. Um, if people in the council are satisfied, I'll open it up to questions from the public, uh, starting with people in the room. Steve, and then. Hi, uh, Steve Whitaker. I only heard mentioned from the, I guess he was Black River Design. Uh, is that David? Jim Drummond. Jim. Uh, that was the only mention I heard of having uh, potential, um, I forget what word he used, but the idea of commercial space, workshop space, so that people could actually live and earn a living on the same property. I think we're we're treading far afield to imagine that we're gonna petrol or electric everybody from Montpelier up to this site to to recreate. It's it's a transportation nightmare, even for the people who want to you know buy a lot there. So. The idea of making that space somewhat self-reliant for food or men or work uh, without so much travel uh, would give us the benefits of the economic development. Uh, possibly we could allow, I mean, if it's if it's designed to accommodate some of the older folks and have housing, affordable housing for caregivers. Maybe that'll free up some of the big, big houses that only have, you know, one person in a four bedroom home in Montpelier. Uh, but we, we need to think about making it attractive to, for both of those functions, elderly care, caregivers, and people who want to live and work nearby. And I didn't hear much of any of that uh, in these early concepts, but I'm okay. sure you're doing a good job. Keep it up. Thanks. Um, okay, Ethan. Uh, my was the same question whether there's any thought of any commercial space. Okay. Same, same, same. Okay, thanks. Looking at people online, um, I see Emma Zava is up first. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, Emma Zavez, um, resident of Montpelier. Um, so as I was looking at the, the sketches, I was um, curious, and I think a lot of city councilors have asked questions about sort of the recreation and what went into that. Um, but I was curious if the consultant could speak a little bit more to sort of the, the fields or designs, like what was put sort of onto those maps. Cause I, I feel like I don't have a really good sense of like what, um, what is is needed or wanted and sort of why we selected these fields or the science building or that type of thing. And I think um, sort of to follow up on that, like I really appreciated the data that Josh shared on sort of the housing affordability crisis in Montpelier. Um, and I would love to like become more informed about sort of recreation needs in Montpelier. Like um, if there's been an analysis of like what are our recreation needs and where are the gaps? You know, like what is the difference between like what we need versus want? Um, you know, where like are you know are people not able to to schedule basketball games and kids like are literally not playing who want to play? Um, or you know, are all of those kids able to play but we wish we we want it to be? on a different kind of court or something like that. So I just wish I had sort of more of a um, insights into to, to the landscape that we have now and, and what our needs, what our gaps versus wants kind of. So if anyone can speak to that, thank you. Okay. Councillor McCullough, do you want me to respond? I, I can wait till you yes. direct. Please, please do. Okay. Um, Thank you, Emma. And I actually remember you from our meeting and your comment in particular, because I that stood out for me um, in a big way because um, I, I kind of felt feel the same way in my own community. Um, and so your your question is well taken. It is a piece of this stage. It's it's actually happening as we speak. I would say this is this is the stage this is happening. 
Um, we got the rec template as we talked about, I'll call it the template that we used to, to mock up and to mass out the site from the rec department based on their data. Um, I do not have that backup data, but it sounds like it's something I could get. So that's gonna be, it's on my list now to get that, um, to understand where those recommendations come, came from. But being that Arnie's part of our team, that's just, that's where the data came from in terms of trying to come up with a template of a, a possible footprint for it. The programming though, as you're talking about kind of dialing into that is still TBD. And the reason for that is because Again, we don't know from the community what it is that we need. And I, I think what you're, what you're really bringing home is something we keep kind of circling around, which is who, I'm gonna name the question. It's like, who decides this is what we need? And the truth could be said, the same could be said about the housing. And there's probably, not, there's not one answer, right? There's not one solution at all um, on either side of this. And so what this is gonna come down to is trying to get from this process, as much feedback as possible to see if there are kind of con there are there is consensus. And one of the exercises we're going to be doing in the public meetings is to look for consensus. We've kind of got this exercise planned where people get up and actually interact with the maps to be able to. Um, and and I say get up because there's one or two on-site options. There's also a virtual option. People are going to do this virtually as well but um, provide their input about where certain types of uses should go and what kind of uses, you know, do we want more multifamily? You know, what is the community want? And so that is what this, this kind of process is, is what is the community asking for? Um, as we get more granular on that, I think that starts to exceed the capacity of a, of a land development team and it gets into programming and specific to recreation, which is not, you know, why I was hired is not my specialty at all, but um, there may be the need once we've identified that this is the proper area for it, this feels like the right balance, what are those exact needs and how do you justify them? I think is your question, like how do you, how do you quantify those needs and identify what those gaps are? And it's not um, an exercise in anecdotal evidence necessarily, but, but what are the real, what is the real data? I hope, I hope that answered your question in terms of process. <laughs> so, thanks. Uh, thanks, Stephanie. Uh, Joe Castellano. Hi, Joe. Thanks for coming. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, just fine. Okay. And uh, oh, I'm in center screen now. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I want to thank you so much for all the detailed information. I was just able to quickly glance at everything. Uh, one of the things I want to uh, suggest to Stephanie and to the city council as well as uh, Bill, as we're moving forward, I mean, certainly there's some members of the public who are gonna be more engaged than others in the process. And I know that you're trying to do as much community re outreach and get public feedback and input so you can best design something that fits the needs of the community. A um, Couple of things I would also stress that maybe we also look at demographic data to help drive some of the decisions because as Josh pointed out in one of the slides, we are an aging population. And at one point there was a downsizers group of about a hundred people. And all of us have not gotten any younger and we're all in these big houses, pretty much one or two people. Kids have either moved out or we never had kids. And now we're looking for something on a single level. And then some of us are on fixed incomes, low incomes. So I'm looking at, maybe we look at some sort of over 55 housing segment as a portion of the housing, or even maybe a co-housing. So you bring in younger families who are having challenges affording something in town with, and have elder around. So you'll have a nice mix in a, in a more vibrant community. That was all I had to say. Thanks, Joe. Yes. You're welcome. Um, Stan Brinkerhoff. Uh, thank you, Jack. Uh, Stan Brinkerhoff from Montpelier. I've got two two quick questions. Um, the first one is in, in, the, in the maximal recreation space diagram, there's there's no housing, uh, but in the opposite diagram, um, there's there's lots for houses, right? Not not um, condos or or duplex style buildings. Um, if we look at the 
average revenue of a multiplayer household at around $70,000 in the last census. Um, and kind of the, the price, the square footage price to build houses for families. Um, have we thought at all about a, a, the maximal design being more completely um, shared houses or condos or, or duplexes? Um, the second question is, if we look at that maximal housing at 500 units, and we use Josh's data of 2.2 people per household, and we add 1,500 people uh, to the country club property, that seems to move kind of the center of gravity of where people live in town. You know, 15% of the population now lives outside of, of the downtown. Um, is there any concern about, and maybe it's comes up in a later phase, is there any concern about utility, um, fire, ambulance, police? Um, is there a cascading effect where we need an extra fire engine and we don't have space for it any longer? Uh, those are just two questions. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Stephanie. Is that master plan, yeah? <laughs> Go ahead, Stephanie. Are you considering? I do have on this one comment. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to say you should you should be a master planner, Stan, because you're thinking of all the things that you do have to think about. So to your second question first, um, absolutely. If you know this is shifting toward whatever this is shifting toward is going to have multiple impacts. And one of those could be, you know, services. They could be, they're going to be utilities. They're going to be other infrastructure. The transit question comes up a bunch. So as this, you know, if it were only 10 units versus 500 units, that very much shifts how much you have to focus on um, those elements. But those are elements that will need to be baked in. They might be baked in in phase two or maybe part of recommendations for phase one. But what your point is in the first question is, um, well, actually, no, I guess it's still part of the second question is really that's something that the public needs to consider as we look at maybe concept plans in the next stage where we're comparing concept plans one, two, and three. We expect to come back with kind of some, uh, I'm not going to call them pros and cons because we're not going to opine on the on the quality of these, but you know, the the trade-offs and the different um constraints and things that are going to impact if you get if you do this, it's going to cost you this. And it may be a cost, for, you know, an actual financial cost. It may be an opportunity cost. Um, it may be, you know, just other types of costs that we're not thinking of. But is that worth it for what you're looking for? So those are absolutely big considerations to be to be taken into account. Um, the first question being, can we consider moving single family into multifamily? Possibly. You know, the max family housing model was shown to show that there could be a variety of different product types because that's what was really came forward a lot in the meetings with the public is lots of different type of product because there's lots of, they wanted, um, a lot of people wanted a, a price point for a lot of people so that you're not just having a site that's only, you know, low income or only high income, you know, that you have a mix of people on, on, a, on a property. But, you know, absolutely during the public engagement phase right now, one of those exercises we're talking about in the public, um, interaction is to specify for those buildable areas, what would you put there? If you want multifamily, stick a pin in it because that's what we want to hear. So thank you for that question. I can respond quickly to the second part too. Um, and this would need to be updated, but a number of few years back, we did a, we had an economist do a study for the city about services. And the conclusion was up to about 2000 more residents. I mean, it didn't, Again, depending where they were and all that, um, was really not going to have a major impact on, on the various things, particularly, um, you know, if this is multifamily housing, uh, it's all going to be required to be sprinkled. So, you know, while we certainly have fire response, we wouldn't necessarily need to add more fire trucks and those kinds of things because there would be sort of built-in fire protection in the buildings. Um, you know, the crime rate uh, is... Probably not, you know, a new neighborhood isn't necessarily suddenly going to result in a whole new crime rate. It's going to be the same folks that live here already. So it would be whatever evolution of needs in those services. Uh, you know, the schools, uh, at least presently, um, the formula for school funding is, you know, the more students you have, the more money you make. So, uh, and I, I, at the schools at one point had the capacity for it for a little while there, they were growing, but I, I think now the school populations leveled off a bit. So that last I knew, and I assume it would be part of this is to determine 
you know, their take on what's a sort of an access, acceptable level of influx of students before they need to talk about new facilities and those kinds of things. Thanks, Bill. Um, Phyllis. Okay. Well, um, I'm trying to get my, trying to get set up here. Very good. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I uh, was attending another meeting by Zoom, so I uh, only came in midstream. I missed Josh's presentation and I was not able to find the packet online. So I have not viewed it yet in my, the very quick uh, viewing of the three uh, options. Uh, I, I certainly need to study them more. I'd like to um, just for a moment, step back and remember when we had, when the city first had the vision of purchasing the country club property. And there were discussions at the time about how this was a unique opportunity for the city to acquire such a large tract of, of land, um, both open fields and, and forested land. And there was a lot of excitement about the city acquiring this unique parcel. I, I participated in a number of meetings and I know that there's been the, the tension between recreation, conservation and housing. And I certainly support a plan that would have some low and affordable housing uh, available. Um, I'm quite dismayed to, that the consultants plans are so um, drastic on either on, on the two far ends that to propose 513 units um, and, and, and the number of streets. And, and, and I, I heard the consultant say that there had not yet been a wildlife corridor assessment. There had not yet been a traffic study. And um, I, I think that these are very important. Perhaps the fire department can deal with another 2000 people, but uh, that number of cars on the road um, would create a, a very different commute on the Barry Montpelier Road. Um, I have heard a lot of talk this evening about uh, recreation in terms of a recreation facility, and I haven't heard anything about outdoor recreation. And I'm sure that the city councilors are well aware that last year there were volunteers from Onion River uh, Nordic Ski Club who groomed the ski trails, ski trails at the uh, country club property. People are out there walking their dogs, they're out there jogging, walking. And so recreation is not only indoors. And in the uh, 35 plus years that I've lived in Montpelier, Anyone who's moved here, I've always told that person, you need to find your winter sport. And certainly some people might play basketball year round, but you don't love winter if you're indoors playing basketball. You love winter when you're outdoors cross country skiing or ice skating or, or, or animal tracking, whatever it might be. That's the love of winter. Outdoor recreation brings in tourism money. It brings people who live in, in, in you know, outlying areas into the city so that they can recreate outdoors. And I, I, I don't know how much consideration there has been of the positive impact of outdoor recreation. And just the last thing I'll, I'd say is that, um, that I would hope that there would be a consideration of uh, not breaking up that property with all of those roads, even in the low housing model, the balanced model, there are so many roads. And, um, and I look forward to the ongoing public discussion. Thank you. Thanks, um, <clears throat> Stephanie, I know from reading the report that there was discussion of uh, outdoor recreation. Do you want to talk a little bit about that as uh, in response? Yeah. 
coming. Absolutely. Yep. Um, no, outdoor recreation is absolutely as much a consideration here as indoor rec. Um, in the plans, there's you know, there shows the different types of outdoor rec spaces. Again, haven't gotten into any programming on those. Exactly what that outdoor rec looks like is going to be very much dependent on community input. Um, but that was absolutely considered, especially in what Arnie provided us in terms of that footprint and that template and the importance of that. We also met extensively with both parks and recreation departments, but parks department, especially talking about um, the importance of continuing the U32 trail, um, showing continuity of that and, uh, and possibly accommodating all of it on this site. You can see that mapped on those sheets themselves. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, is there anyone else who has any questions or comments they'd like to make before we wrap this up? Sure, if you can keep it brief. Yeah, it's brief. Um, the relationship of this property plan process to the downtown master plan. And I know that our the outdatedness of our downtown plan has been an issue in revising zoning. Uh, it's been subject to several meetings. And might our recreation needs be handled in a distributed fashion? Some of it at Vermont College. I, I'm a firm believer that the, the liquor, the state's liquor building could be stored anywhere. And that's a great building to use as a rec center. Uh, so it is in the floodplain. But my point is that we, we need to kind of think of this in a more holistic fashion and not let one need of a pent up demand for recreation uh, de define the site for elk rather than look at what our other options are even in a distributed manner. I bet there's pieces of Vermont College that would serve that well, and there's potentially the high school liquor building down there too. So I just, I want to understand how these different planning processes sequence or fit together. Is this thing going to move slow enough to where the city's downtown plan catches up? I think it's been back burner. Um, so okay. thanks, Steve. Yeah. Anyone else who wants to be heard on this evening's discussion before we wrap up? Nothing from you, Bill? I'm sure Stephanie's going to get to it, but just then a reminder that the next steps from this are three more sessions, but I will turn that to the team to <laughs> tell you all about that. I was going to say, okay, come see us. Um, come see us on the 28th. We're meeting on the site itself. All of this is right on the website. It's blasted in every forum we can find. Um, but again, 28th is on the site itself uh, on the 2nd, February 2nd um, at night, 6 to 8 o'clock, right there in city chambers. Um, we'll be having another meeting that will also be hybrid like this one. And then on the 9th from noon to 2 is a virt all virtual session. So if you want to attend a meeting, if that's something that someone, you know, especially someone you know, a neighbor, a friend who's looking to get involved, please send them there. Otherwise, you can send them to the website and the city's YouTube channel um, will have a five minute video. It's not a TikTok. I will say I was very tempted to learn what TikTok really is in order to do one to get more engagement, but I'm not that clever. Um, and so we have this video that'll kind of be a lot of what you heard tonight, but packed into five minutes and giving just the little teasers so people can go to the materials themselves, dive in a little more, and then take the survey. And we're hoping we'll get a good turnout from the survey. And our plan is to come back and meet with you in March and recap what we've heard and start to and ask some questions. It'll kind of depend on what we hear, uh, what we're going to be asking you. But in March, um, end of March, I think the 22nd is our target date to meet with you again to go through what we're planning for the concept planning phase uh, stage within this this last bit here over the spring. Great. Thanks a lot, Stephanie. This is great. Thank you so okay. much. I look forward to seeing everybody. Sometime it'll be in person, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. Okay. That uh, wraps up item six, Country, Country Club Road presentation. I don't believe we have anything uh, 
to take up under other business. Um, city council reports. I have nothing. Very, very pleased with the presentation. Thank you. No report from me tonight. All right. Okay, the one thing I will take up in my portion of the city council reports is that tomorrow is uh, 2023 Homeless Awareness Day, and there will be a, a big event at, uh, at the State House with a variety of things happening throughout the day. And uh, so if you have the opportunity to be there, I encourage you to do that. Don't forget Palin. I'm sorry? Oh, Palin, sorry. I didn't see your hand up. But do you have something, oh. Palin? It's okay, I don't have anything to share. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Thanks. Uh, John, do you have anything? A no clerk's report, no city manager's approach report. So we can, without objection, we'll conclude the meeting at 8, 11 p.m. Thank you all.